nice snowy day like this in February. It's, uh, it is, I guess, one of those days where there's a game on later, but it's really not that big of a game because the Browns aren't playing, but um, we do have so much, though, to be thankful for this morning, and, and in times where we're quiet before the Lord, in times where we are in fellowship with one another, those are both times where God wants to be speaking to us. He wants to be incorporated in our fellowship time. He wants to be leading us through this. He wants us to, to be listening and to be looking for his will and for his words to be given. And, you know, as we, as we go about and study of Romans, we see how God is so faithful to us in the, the highs and the lows of life. And uh, I was just telling John that as I was preparing this week and as I was coming out of the sickness and, and then having it ramp up again and, and try to get me and, and sack me a little bit more, um, it was just a matter of remembering that we are pilgrims, that we are on a journey through life, that there are going to be highs, there are going to be lows, there are going to be days where we feel great, and there are going to be days where we're in bed suffering. But through all of that, God wants to meet us and endure in us. He wants to help us stand. He wants to help us to be able to call out. He wants us to be able to acknowledge him and encourage others, even in the times where we're going through stuff and it's hard. You know, in, in Bunyan's book, Pilgrim's Progress, little Christian or, or Christian, as he made his way on the journey, carried a pack around and it weighed him down. And it was only at a point where he came before the cross that he was able to let go of those burdens that were holding on to him. And I'll tell you, in our day-to-day -day walk with the Lord, coming before him each morning, taking on his mercy, it's the way in which we say, Lord, we're giving you our stuff. We give you our lives. Now walk us through the path that you have for today. And the encouragement of putting on the armor of God and it is so awesome to know that our king not only takes those hardships and takes the things away from us that we can't deal with ourselves, but then he gives us everything that we need to walk and to stand in him. And so this morning as we come into Romans 5, we can only say thank you, Lord Jesus, for your goodness and your grace and your mercy, for your favor that goes beyond anything that this world could throw at us. In John 10.10, 10, Jesus said that the thief comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But he said that I, Jesus, have come that they may have life and have it to the full. To me, there's death, there's life. In this verse, Jesus is pointing out there are two ways here. There's no middle ground. There are two ways, life or death. One comes to rob you, but I come to give. And obviously, Jesus wants us to choose life. Well, we're going to bounce around Romans chapter 5 today, and I'm not going to focus on the whole of it at all, but I want to point out, if we were to look at Romans 12 through 20, I, I just... Put some words together here to, to kind of give us a picture and an understanding of, that, of what that scripture reveals to us. And so it would be the focus, but we're not going to read it right now. But let me read these words to you as to what the Lord showed me as I read through these, these verses. From the dawn of mankind, darkness dared to develop deceiving and devouring 
delinquent disciples. We see the feebleness of flesh, people's problematic imperfections, man's mishaps, women wobbling in worry and temptation, children choosing the candy of corruption, humanity hindered by horrible haste and perishing in pride, doomed in darkness and despair, separated by sinful saturations. Yet in the distance, a light grows, cracking the darkness and prevailing a brilliance of color and beauty that brings forth raw awe. The light that becomes so bright that if stared into would cause one's eyes to faint. This pure radiance penetrates rationality and invigorates the soul cry, satisfying the longing heart in the void of displacement. The Son, the Son of God, Son of Man, Savior, Light of Life. You see, there's been so much in the relationship between God and man. There's been so much just in the beginning of that relationship. And if we were to go back to Genesis where Romans 12, the verses 12 through 20 focus on, we would see that in the man, Adam, and obviously in woman, Eve, we came to a place where there was departing from God. The relationship had been severed due to disobedience, due to sin. And yet, we see in God's actions, in His love, in the manifestation of bringing about a way for Adam and Eve to have life with Him and continue in life with Him, we see the representation of Jesus. And we see in Jesus, the lamb that God slain and fashioned clothing for Adam and Eve. We see the picture of what Jesus would be for all mankind. And as Adam and Eve were representatives of the first of mankind, so it will be until the last of mankind that Jesus, the lamb, is slain. Not only for the redemption of our souls, but of the covering of of our nakedness, the covering of the sin and the despair that come along with sin. And so, as we speak this morning of Paul's words, as we enter into the beginning portion of this chapter, we can know that we come before God who is so faithful in trials that we go through. He is so faithful in the joy of life that we have nothing to fear. We have nothing to look at and say, what can I do? Because we can always go to our king and to our lamb. Verse 6, For when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely a righteous man will one die. Yet, Perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we now have received the reconciliation. I'm going to jump to verse 18 because therefore, as through one man's Offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, 
so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. As we come into verse 1 of chapter 5, Paul is quick to give us encouragement that it is in Christ alone that we are able to boast. That it is in Christ alone that we are able to live. It is that one man, Jesus Christ, in his obedience that has brought about the righteousness that we have the blessing that we are living in. You see, Adam in his representation and disobedience is like us. And so as men and women, we are naturally born into that predicament of sin. But thankfully, what Christ has done has overcome that predicament. And we're going to focus there this morning. So in verse 1 and reading the first two verses... Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. This is is such a packed portion of scripture right here that we need to unpack it to really fully get everything that Paul is saying here. The word that I would focus on this week is the word justified. Justified. Now, when you hear the word justified, I like to look at the roots of these words. Just. When you think of just, you probably think of justice. And when you think of justice, you think of a court system or a way in which there is order. And we see that it is in Jesus Christ that we are justified, that we are found to be right. Not not because of the act alone in what he did but because in the renewal of life that brought, was brought forth out of the actions of obedience that he stood and fell and rose again. In. And so in being justified by Jesus Christ, we don't need to think of ourselves as anything great, but we need to remember that the one who justifies us is the greatest. He is the only one in whom could bring about justification. He is the only one that had the legal right to claim us as his own. No one else had that right. We're going to break it even further. We are able to boast in Christ. Why? Why are we able to talk about Jesus and boast in him? What did what did he do? What did he do? He died for us. He did. What else did he do? Empowered us. Very much did that. What else did Jesus do when when he took upon his role and he justified us? What did he do that enables us to boast in him? He died for us. He empowered us. Took our sins. Paid for our sin. Okay. Gave us life. Now, I want you just to think about this for a moment. There have been stories about loggers that go off and do these really bright things like cut trees by themselves. 
And they're probably men that have to get a job done. That's most of the time what happens. There are stories about people that are trapped in car accidents and, and linger in their cars for days. There are abundant stories out there. I'm sure that you've heard of multiple ones in which someone is in a predicament where death is surely the case. And then a rescuer comes. Now, in these stories, I'd like you to think about one particularly and put yourself in that story. You're trapped under a log candy and, and there's no way out. You can't reach the chainsaw. Your pocket knife is too dull. Okay? Jimmy, you're stranded on a desert island because you tried to sail across the sea and it didn't work and you're hopeless and all you have is a soccer ball. No. <laughs> but we can put ourselves in these desperate situations, can't we? I mean, maybe we've been in a place where we have felt so desperate. There's no way out of this. There's no hope in this. I don't know what I'm going to do. You see, it's in these places that a rescuer comes and brings life out of a situation that would naturally result in death. Now, I've heard enough of these stories where firefighters come in and they save the day and, and then they go to the hospital and they visit with this, with this person that has been at a place where there were only two routes, life or death, and, and they're alive. And what are the words that come out of people's mouths at that point? Thank you. You're my hero. You saved me. You were my only hope. You were the one that could do this. No one else was around. No one else heard my cry. As we have lived to this point, and as we go forward living, we will continue to find ourselves or find others in positions where there are only two choices life or death. And a lot of times we're going to find those who are wrapped up and entangled in things that look a lot like death. Our only boast is in Jesus Christ. Our only hope is in Him. He is the only one who can justify us in every situation of life. He is the only one who can justify those who are entangled in those death situations. And so though we happen upon them, we aren't the rescuer. We are the ones who know the rescuer. And we can boast in Him. We can boast in Him alone. It's not me that's a good person. It's because I love the Lord and He loves me and He loves you that we have a boasting in Jesus Christ. Jesus enables us to stand in grace before Him and the Father. Now I want you to think back into VBS days or, or the morning times of of listening and learning from a teacher. And I want you to remember a man named Stephen. Because Stephen found himself as a disciple of Christ, found himself in that place where he was wrapped up in a situation where death was inadamant. In, in no, not inadamant. Evident. Uh, imminent. That is the word. Thank you. There are so many words that I can put my feet in my mouth and the words still come out somehow. But that word that we just said, death was there. It was, it was raw. It was there. It was thick around him. And yet he was able. 
in the midst of being stoned, in the midst of being taken to a place of death, he was able to look to who? He looked to Christ. The heaven actually literally opened up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And Stephen was able to stand. Jesus was justifying Stephen in the midst of that horrible situation. And what did it allow Stephen to do? It allowed him to emulate his king. It allowed him to to bring forgiveness into a situation where there was only death to be had. And in that, he was able to bring life into the situation. We have been made right, justified, through faith alone. We've talked much about how Paul points out again and again and again how that it is not of works. It is not of anticipation of anything we can hope for in ourselves. It is not of entitlement. It is not of pride. It is not of faith that that alone could produce enough. It is not even today, he says, in suffering that we can go before God and prove that we are worthy. It is only in Jesus Christ who we are able to boast in and who stands for us and in us, enabling us to stand. And out of this position of being justified in Jesus, we have been brought into a new covenant, a new position where we can have peace with God. Now you might be saying to yourself, yes, that's great, Mike, and it's very simple, and you're trying to make big points out of these things. But it's not as simple as we think it is. Holy Spirit, open our eyes and our ears and our hearts and our understanding to know how huge this is. I hate to say it, But as the American church, we have simplified Jesus so much that we just think he's our pal and that it's not that big of a deal. The reality is that what Jesus did, no one else could do. Without him, we are sunk. We are done. We don't even get off the ground. We are dead. It is in Him who brings justification that we are made right. Legally, He stamps us. He says, they're mine, Father. And in that, He reconciles us in relationship with the King, with the God of all ages, with the Spirit that leads. And to me, that is bigger than anything that can ever else be done. Peace with God. Now I know that all of us here have experienced peace. Maybe it's when the kids go away for the weekend. Maybe it's when you're in your car and you get to choose what radio station you want to listen to. Maybe it's in that time of being silent before God. But I know that we have experienced peace. Maybe peace comes in that time where you've been sick for a long time and health comes about. Maybe it's that point where you've been working hard, working at something with all of your might and it comes to completion and you can sit down and take a moment. But peace with God is different than that kind of peace. You see, that would be peace that God offers us, the peace of God. But peace with God, peace with God is something altogether different. Because peace with God 
is not something that we can have unless Jesus justifies us. Now, the peace of God can be felt in this world. It can be felt by people that don't even necessarily have a relationship with him. They can feel peace. And that peace is derived from God, the giver of peace, the prince of peace. But peace with God only comes in being justified by Jesus. Peace of God is subjective. Right? You can feel when you have God's peace. When you're in a position where, where anxiety is calling and, and pounding at the door. And people are surrounding you with, with offers and temptations or with needs and cries of help. Peace can come in those times, right? But that's the peace of God. What he gives us so that we feel his presence and we can continue on. But peace of God comes because of peace with God. And the peace with God is objective. It's like concrete. We can understand concrete, right? It's real easy. It's there or it's not. It's soft or it's hard, but it's there. And when it hardens, it's there for good most of the time. Peace with God is foundation. As concrete would be foundation in building a house, peace with God is foundational in our relationship with Him. And it's with peace with God that enables us to build and to grow in our relationship through Christ. It's peace with God that allows the Holy Spirit to be active in our lives, to speak into our hearts and our minds, giving us direction, giving us understanding, giving us the way and the next step. Peace with God is accomplished and has been accomplished and will continue to be accomplished because of what Jesus has done in ministering obediently with the Father. If we were to go build a house together, we would understand quickly That foundation is the key. It wouldn't be long before our house was built that didn't have a foundation that it would falter. That the walls would start to crack. That things would start to to fall apart quickly. You see, it's understood that in building and in processing with God, that peace with God, that foundation aspect of who Jesus is must be at the base of who we are. And then the peace of God fills us continually. Now I know some of you are saying, but Mike, sometimes I'm anxious. Sometimes I have trouble and, and I don't understand. Sometimes I'm afraid. And I would say, you're humans. We're people. But because of our position, our peace with God in Jesus Christ, being justified by Him, we are able to call out to Him and the peace of God to fill the cracks and the voids. And it's in that, that the relationship we have with Jesus, others can understand how good and pleasant it is to walk in unity and in unity with the Lord. Because it's in that peace with God, that foundation, and the peace of God, that people are able to see Jesus Christ in us. They're able to see that it is not me. I'm not doing anything. I'm boasting in Christ. Look, he's pouring out of me. Do you see how I'm able to go through this situation, not falling apart, not dying of anxiety and and being overwhelmed in this, it's not me. It's my king. It's the light that overcomes the darkness. He is alive in us. 
He justifies us. Not only so, verse 3, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. What? We, we find glory? We, we glory in our sufferings? In tribulation? Knowing. First of all, let's, let's just get, get to that point. Are you saying that we, we glory, we, we have, we have excitement about suffering? Well, yes and no. You see, again, there's two sides to suffering. There's the death side of suffering and there's the life in suffering. And it depends on that peace with God, that foundational layer. If we are founded in God and we have the peace of God through Christ, then we can suffer and we can go through things and we can look like Christ in the midst of agony, in the midst of pain, in the midst of toil, in the midst of hardness. We can shine, but not us, Christ in us. You see, if we try to suffer through things, and allow the suffering to be the focus, then we become dead. Then we become black. We get burned out. And so, we also glory in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character. And character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so, yes, church, we can say that suffering can be good and it can bring production. Suffering times can be productive times in our lives. And Lord, we are not asking for an outpouring of suffering, but we're asking for an outpouring of your glory in times of suffering. Think about the last time that you really went through something and suffered. What was the way in which you administrated through that time? Did you try to do it yourself? Did you just push harder and say, I can get this done? You know what? I'll call on some friends. I can get this done. Or did you fall down and say, Lord Jesus, I can't do this. I cannot go through this alone. I cannot do this on my own. I need you. Help me, Lord. Help me. You see, suffering helps us to understand what it means to have perseverance. Perseverance draws us to a place of focus. When I hear the word perseverance, the word perceive or perception kind of triggers in my brain. You see, because when I understand that I need to have perseverance in a situation, it really makes me get to a point of focusing in on what is going on here. What's the main thing? I have to persevere through this. I need to understand what I'm persevering through. What's going on? What's the main portion here? And so as we suffer, we start to focus in on what the suffering is. Going through any situation, we have to take the wisdom that God gives us in perseverance to focus on the issue and then present that issue to God. In James, we're told that we can go through trials and tribulations and that in that, there can be joy. But in the process, there cannot be doubt. We have to go through every portion of life, whether suffering or good, 
with a perseverance that draws us to focus in on Jesus. And in that, to trust him that he will faithfully endure with us through every step of the process. Perseverance, that focus, that understanding that we can continue when we trust in the Lord, then produces character. When we talk to people about character, when I talk to my kids about character, I help them to understand that character at its base level is about our nature. It's about who we are as a person and who we put our trust in. It's about where we go when things get hard and when there's a test, when there's a challenge. You see, character, the way I describe it to the boys, would be that character is the things in you and the relationship with the Lord that he gives that help you to be tried and true. That when things rise up, the Lord rises up in us. And when it gets hard, we don't go to ourselves, but we go to him. Character is revealed in suffering. And again, character and perseverance are added unto us as we relate to God with his peace. It's foundation that never, never ends and that we have to continue to go go to God for these things. So we have the Super Bowl today and obviously our Browns are not there. But we've had a really good, and I know some of you are going, oh man, I hope he doesn't talk about football because I don't care about football. But I want to talk about two players, okay? Two players that are on the Browns. Both of them are quarterbacks. One, his last name is Hoyer. The other, his last name is Manziel. Now you've probably heard more about Manziel than you did Hoyer, even though Hoyer had a lot more playing time than Manziel. Okay, so we've got some opinions already about the two. Now, here's the thing. When you look at character, would those of you that have understanding of who Hoyer is and who Manziel is, we're not going to actually go there. We're not going to point out who you think has the more character. But what I want to do is look at the fact that these men have presented themselves to the public. They have been tested. They have had to go through not only football games, but generally life in Cleveland. One of these men has gone out. He has put forth his best effort. He's been knocked down. He's been hurt, but he's gotten up. He hasn't always done the perfect thing in every situation. But he continues to get up and continues to go forward. Now the other, he had a lot to say about who he was. He had a lot to say about how good he could be. And in fact, I guess I will have to use his name. He even put himself out there as Johnny Football, as Johnny Cleveland. But you see, when the points came for him to be tested, to be tried and true, to show and reveal his character, there wasn't much there. In fact, it was a lot of air coming out of his lips and not a lot to back him up. You see, we can be like Manziel's. It's very easy when we forget about who justifies us. You see, to go in and to be tried and to be made true takes that objective layer that only Jesus can lay down in our lives to say you are at peace with God. And so we can have perseverance and we can have character in those times 
when the world would look and say, wow, there's a blitz coming and they're under pressure. And finally, this character and this perseverance that comes at times of suffering produces hope. We focus when we're in times of suffering. We reveal our makeup in times of suffering. But we also extend in faith. And our peace with God becomes clearer. And the peace of God becomes revealed and becomes accepted. You see, we have hope in the glory of of God. And so, how does this all come together? Well, we see that God understands that without Him, we're sunk. Adam and Eve to Mike and Havila, we are sunk. We are done without Him. And so he prepares the way. He gives us the way in Jesus Christ. And he gives us not only the way in the good times, but he gives us the way in the hard times. And he says, I will reveal myself to you and through you as we walk this together. My question is, to us this morning and the question that God put on my heart this week is what will we do with the life of Christ that has been given to us what will we do with it today there's going to be a game where two teams go out and try and prove that they are capable of overcoming the other in that game, the Super Bowl, we have a man represented on the Seahawks who is their quarterback. His name is Russell Wilson. This question continued to come to me as I thought about Russell Wilson. What, Russell, will you do with the life that Jesus Christ has put in you? He's a born-again Christian. He's a man that looks to the Lord for direction. What will you do, Russell? He's already doing it. You see, before the game is even played, before one down is ever aired for people to see, before he ever feels the pigskin in his hands, he's already using the life that Jesus Christ put in him to declare Jesus as king. He said, you know what? I'm not going out today as a football player who happens to be a Christian. Today, I go on the field as a man of God who's going to play some football. You see, he has the understanding, that peace with God that only came to him through justification and reconciliation in Jesus Christ. And now he can go into a thing that the world looks at and says, my goodness, how your, your stomach has to be full of butterflies. You have to be going crazy. This is the biggest game of your life. And Russell Wilson says, I got the peace of God because I'm at peace with God. And today you will see in me, Jesus Christ. You will hear from my lips praise and honor to the King of Kings. Don't boast about who I am. Russell Wilson boasts about who Jesus is in him. And that is what we're called to do. And so again, I ask us, what will we do with the life of Christ that has been given to us? Peace, perseverance, character, and hope reveal our king. Our position is to go out and boast in him. Let's stand up and pray together.
Lord Jesus, you know that today none of us are going to go march out onto a field before millions of people. You know that we have our own callings in this life. And you know exactly what they are, Lord, because you see and know us intimately. Lord, today we are so thankful that we are at peace with you. And we thank you, Lord, that it is through your love and through your obedience and through your sacrifice and through your life that we can receive your peace. Lord, no matter what it is that we're enduring right now, whether it's relational, Lord, whether it's financial, whether it's emotional, whether it's something that's going on, Lord, that just seems totally out of whack. Lord, if we're pinned under a tree or we're trapped in a situation that looks bleak, we know that we can have your peace because of who you are in us and the foundation that we have to stand in you. Lord Jesus, today we ask that you would remind us and encourage us in your armor, that you would reveal to us, Holy Spirit, just how good we have things. The setting is right, Lord Jesus. We thank you that you have made it right. And we ask that you would help us, Lord, in the cracks and in the the suffering that we go through, that you would be revealed, that we would boast in you this day, this week, Lord, that when things become hard, we don't turn to ourselves to accomplish it, but we turn to you. And in that, we boast of who you are. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are faithful that you persevere and that you show us the way and that you are the way. Lord, help us to walk in your way this week. Let us reveal who you are and let us do it with great joy. We praise you, Lord. We thank you for your your goodness and your grace. Let your mercy overflow onto all of us. And Lord, let us be one with you. In Jesus' name, amen.